to the Great Minds Program, it says here. Uh, this program brings outstanding people from all walks of life to into the rich and enlightened our community, it says here. And uh, as we uh, know, we've had over the last uh, few months, we had uh, a professor of uh, astrophysics from Chicago, we have Anna Roosevelt from University of Illinois. Uh, we had Roald Hoffman, that's a little earlier, uh, Nobel chemist. Uh, we had Dean Pfefferman, who's an mathematician. And today, oh boy, today, uh, I'm going to welcome our speaker, Dr. Martin Chalfin. Uh, he's a William R. Keenan Jr. Professor of Biological Sciences at Columbia University. Probably the best university in, in the solar system, at least, huh? uh, since uh, I enjoy uh, confusing students there for about 30 years. He's also the chair of the Department of Biological Sciences. He was elected at the National Academy of Sciences in 2004 and received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2008. Was that good? We recommend it. Right? <laughs> it really is. Uh, Dr. Chalfi grew up in Chicago and Skokie, the oldest of three sons, so he's no stranger to this area. He did his undergraduate work at Harvard, graduated in 1965, intending to be a math major. He switched to biochemistry because he combined his interest in chemistry, math, and biology. Fantastic. Spent the summer there after his junior year working in the laboratory in Los Robos, Harvard. And he quoted that he apparently was not very successful. He said it was so disheartening to completely fail that I decided I shouldn't be in biology. As a result, in the senior year, he completed his major biology and took courses in law, theater, and Russian literature. He returned to Harvard for graduate studies and received his PhD in neurobiology in 1977. Dr. Chalfi conducted his postdoctoral research in the laboratory of molecular biology at Cambridge, England, and with Sidney, and with Sidney Brenner and John Sulston. And uh, the three published a paper in 1985 on the neural circuit with touch sensitivity in CLNs. He credited his time as a postdoc there as making him the scientist he is today. Chalfi then left the uh, laboratory of molecular biology in 1982 to join the faculty at Columbia University in the Department of Biology, Biological Sciences and continued to study seal events, touch mutants. At Columbia, Chalfi lab used the needle tool and seal events to investigate aspects of nerve cell development and function, the wealth of development, anatomical, genetic, and molecular information available to seal events provided a powerful and multifaceted approach to the studies. This led, this work led to the 2008 Nobel Prize in Chemistry, along with the summer in the Rura, for the discovery of both the discovery and development of the lean fluorescent protein GFP. From the article on Chalfi and Wikipedia, which is the founder of the World Knowledge you know, we learned that he married to a exiler who later joined him on the faculty of Yale University and gave him, well, this is the no, best part. Don't, don't, don't say don't it. Don't <laughs> Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a good one. He 
slept through the phone call from the Nobel Prize committee. And he woke up, he knew the prize would have been announced already, so he said, okay, who's the schnook that got the prize this time? And so he opened up his laptop, got to the Nobel Prize site, and found out that he was the schnook. <laughs> so without any further ado, it's already too much, I introduce our speaker for today, uh, Martin Chow. I wander away from this mic and suddenly you can't hear me, you know, wave your arms or something to tell me uh, to move back towards the mic or if you have trouble hearing. Uh, so uh, I've titled my talk uh, with this strange word, Adventures in Non-Translational Research. So I want to just say a little bit, translational research is a buzzword that uh, seems to be seen more and more these days and I'll have a lot more to talk about it at the end of the talk. But it is supposed to represent a, 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 a very important trend. That is that uh, research shouldn't just stay in the laboratory. It should be applied to medical problems. We should translate the discoveries of the lab into treatments in the clinic. And that's the translational part of it. I have absolutely no problem with that. It's just where the emphasis is. So, uh, and as you'll see, uh, virtually everything I work on it does not translate into the clinic. And so I want to talk about that, talk about sort of the joys of the research that I've been involved in, tell you a little bit about the strange world of science publishing and how things get done, or at least how things got done in my lab, and uh, give some examples of some of the work. So let me start out with the problem that I have been addressing uh, actually since I started in Sidney Brenner's lab at, in England in 1977, and that is a, a problem of uh, mechanosensation. Biologists have a very good idea how we, our bodies, can sense some sensory signals, like light. We know about rhodopsin in the retina, we know how that is, how that leads how light leads to changes in the molecule that then leads to electrical changes eventually in the cells. We also know how chemicals act as signals, whether those are odors or tastes or hormones within the body or neurotransmitters. We know that these chemicals bind to receptors and we know the consequences of that binding for cell function. So we have a pretty good idea about how these senses work. But the senses that are up on this slide are all senses that work because cells have been physically perturbed. They've been moved around. And these are collectively called the mechanical senses. And these include hearing, touch, our sense of balance and acceleration, proprioception, which is our, the position of our limbs in space. It also includes our detection of blood pressure and other pressures within our bodies. Um, it affects our bone growth. If we send astronauts out into space, their bones fall apart because they're no longer getting the pressure and detecting that pressure. If we have people like tennis players that use one arm much more than others, then that arm, the bones grow stronger because of all the tension that the muscles have been placing on those bones. And these are mechanical stresses that then lead to changes in the bone structure and other parts of the body. All of these mechanical senses have one thing in common. We have no idea how they work. This is terrific because it means, for those of us that are interested in this problem, it's sort of the holy grail of sensory biology and it means we're in business for quite a while. So this is the problem I've been working on. And part, uh, and, and so part of any scientific problem is to actually find the right organism in which to do the studies. And I think that I was lucky because we did find an organism that was very good uh, towards these studies because we realized we couldn't go after what was the sensor biochemically. We couldn't uh, use molecular biology per se to use it. We needed a new approach. And that new approach was to find an organism that we could get mutants, variants of. And we would find mutants that were defective in a 
mechanical sense. Once we had the mutants, we could characterize the genes, clone the genes, find out what the genes made, and that would give us the first candidates for the molecules that actually are doing the sensing, or what we call transduction molecules. And so the animal that we used for these genetic studies is a very small roundworm called Cenorhabditis elegans, or abbreviated C. elegans. And we know a lot about this animal. It is the only animal that we know every single cell division going from the fertilized egg all the way to the adult. So we know every cell in the animal. And also because basically it's a one millimeter long tube as an adult, it's been sliced like a salami for the electron microscope. Each one of these sections blown up 10,000 fold and someone meticulously went through and followed every single cell in the animal and so it's the only animal that we know that it has 302 nerve cells and all those nerve cells are connected. We know how they're connected. It's the only animal we know the wiring diagram of its nervous system. It also was the first animal to have all of its DNA sequenced. It was sort of the model for the Human Genome Project. Uh, we have a vast amount of information about this animal and it's very easy to get mutants of all sorts of processes and lots of people all over the world have been using this. We've used it because these six cells diagrammed here on this slide are the six cells that sense gentle touch. So I have a, a video here to show you what gentle touch looks like. Whoops. However, I have to get the pointer in the right place. Hopefully the movie will go. So we touch the animal and it moves backwards. Now a touch insensitive mutant looks like that. You touch it, nothing happens to it. So it's not a really exciting movie to show you. Uh, and that's what we do. We have spent a lot of time tickling worms to try to find mutants that don't respond to touch. Now, actually, it's a little more sophisticated than just looking for animals that don't respond. We actually take an eyebrow hair, glue it onto a toothpick, and draw it across the animal. And the animal, if it's touch sensitive, will move. And if it's touch insensitive, it doesn't move. But we have to be a little more careful than that because, uh, just to tell you, dead animals also don't move, so it's hard to distinguish. So you need a way of distinguishing them. So an animal that moves when you touch it with the hair, or doesn't, touch, doesn't move when you touch it with the hair, but will move when you prod it with a little platinum wire that we use to pick up the animals, showing that it is capable of normal movement. These are animals that are insensitive to touch and they're defective in these six cells. So we've used that and over the years, especially using undergraduates uh, in the lab, we have been able to isolate pretty close to 500 strains that are insensitive to touch. These 500 strains represent mutations in only 17 genes and these 17 genes, uh, so we have multiple mutations in each gene and we've cloned, at this time we've now cloned all of these genes and know what their products are and now we're trying to understand how they work. But it was really that project, that trying to understand the genes that are the sensors of, or the genes that make the proteins that are the sensors of touch that led us uh, into this byway of looking at green fluorescent protein. At the time that I first heard about green fluorescent protein, and I'll tell you that story in a minute, I had been working on this animal for about 10 years and every time I gave a seminar, I would say how wonderful the animal was, much like what I said a couple of minutes ago, but also to say that the animal was also wonderful because it was transparent. You could see right through it, and if you put the animals under a microscope, you could see every one of the cell nuclei and actually follow things in the living animal. So we knew every cell in the animal, we could see it. It was transparent. After a 10 years of saying that I work on a transparent animal, I finally got the idea that it was a transparent animal. Now when we cloned the genes that we had found in our studies, we wanted to ask as the first question, is this gene that's needed for the sense of touch actually turned on in these touch sensing cells? And we wanted to have a way of showing that the gene was turned on. And at the time there were three ways of doing this. We could use an antibody against the protein product and ask, is it in the cell? And here's an example of one that's actually in the six touch sensing cells. Or we could use a, a, 
we could take the genes basically have two parts. They have the part that says what should be made, the protein, and they have another part that says when, where, and how it should be made. So if you take that controlling region and then have it make the bacterial protein beta-galactosidase, wherever that gene is turned on, you'll see that enzyme activity. And that's what's shown in the middle here, again in the six cells. Or we could actually directly look for the messenger RNA that was made in the cells by in situ hybridization, which didn't work very well, but we basically can see it. Here's the three cells here and then uh, others right there. So all of these would allow us to look and answer that question, is the gene turned on in a particular cell? But there was a problem with all three of these methods. First of all, all of them required getting something into the animal. So the animal had to be permeabilized. Well, before you permeabilize it, that is, cause it to be, have a lot of holes in it, you need to kill it. You need to fix it so things don't move away. So you had to kill the, prep, the animals. You had to fix them, that is, make sure nothing was going to move around. Then you had to permeabilize them so the reagents could get into the animal, whether it was the antibody or the substrate for the enzyme or the DNA that we used to bind to the RNA and the in situ. Every one of these procedures required something getting in. So we had to fix, permeabilize the animals, and it took several days to do the experiments. In addition, once you did the experiment on the animals, because they were now dead animals, if you wanted to do it again, you had to start all over again and do it again. So this was sort of the problem. And it was at this point that inspiration struck. And inspiration is different for different people. Uh, one of the best examples I know to describe inspiration, scientific inspiration, is this cartoon, uh, which I'll read. Cambridge, 1953, shortly before discovering the structure of DNA, Watson and Crick, depressed by their lack of progress, visit the local pub I'll have a double Felix. Um, so mine was not as colorful as this. Uh, for me, it was going to a seminar. The seminar was given by this man, Paul Brem. And Paul Brem, uh, as the introduction to his talk, started talking about work of another person, Osamu Shimamura, on this jellyfish, Aquaria Victoria. Osamu Shimamura is a really amazing person. I would suggest to all of you that if you have a chance, you have a, a half an hour to spare, go to the NobelPrize.org website and listen to his Nobel Prize lecture. This is a man who at the age of 16 was told he could no longer go to school, that he had to go and work in a factory, and that the factory was not in the city where he lived, but it was on the other side of the mountains in the adjacent valley. This actually turned out to be a fairly good thing for him because he was, well, he was 16 in 1945 and the city that he moved out of to go and work in the factory was Nagasaki. He saw from that other valley, he saw the flash of the atomic bomb there, went in and rescued people and took care of people, but the college he was going to go to was destroyed. Uh, he was eventually able to go to pharmacy school because that was the only thing they built at the time for him to be able to go, and then went off to graduate school. At graduate school, he was told, um, well, here's a project. There is this crustacean called Cyprodyna. It's a very interesting crustacean, because if you take dried Cyprodyna, put it in your hand, put a little water in it, and just grind them up, you get this nice little light that's produced. So how do they produce light? They're bioluminescent organisms. And then he was told, oh yeah, by the way, th we've given this project to several other people before and they've all failed on it. But have a good time, go ahead. So he goes off and he finds out the answer. He purifies the protein, he figures out how this organism generates light, and that allows him to come to the United States to work with a guy named Frank Johnston at Princeton, who then suggests to him that they're gonna look at a different bioluminescent organism. There are lots of bioluminescent organisms. Fireflies and glowworms and bacteria and jellyfish and so on. And jellyfish were what Frank Johnson said they were gonna study. So they go off to Friday Harbor Lab, which is in Washington State during the summer, and they start working on jellyfish. Frank Johnston has a completely wrong idea. He goes off and does other things. 
Shimamura is going to figure out why these jellyfish produce light. Now, this is a very bad picture of the jellyfish because uh, it's falsely colored. The jellyfish actually produce green light. And so he wanted to figure out how this was. And he tried everything. He, he was a very good, and still is, a very good biochemist. He tried everything he could, and everything failed. So finally, one night, and he's working well past dark in the lab, he finally is thoroughly disgusted with everything. He takes the samples that he's, the, the fractions that he's produced, and he throws them in the sink. Now, in the sink is seawater and some old jellyfish parts, and he just throws them out and is, turns off the light and is about to walk out the door when he turns back and happens to look at the sink, which is glowing brightly. He figures out, by thinking about it for a moment, that there must have been something in the sink that he had neglected in his preparation. And what that was was calcium. He purifies the protein rather, rather easily, and when calcium is added to this protein, which he called a quarin, after the name of the jellyfish, he then sees that it produces light, very brilliant light. The only problem is the jellyfish produce a green light, and a quarin produces a blue light. So he immediately knows there's another problem he's got to solve. And so he takes a handheld mineral light, a UV light source, and he goes around to his fractions and he looks at them and he says, wow, there's one of them that when I excite it with UV light, I get green out. And he called it at first the green protein. We now call it the green fluorescent protein. And that's why the jellyfish are green. It's because the light doesn't go to be, the, the energy from a quarin doesn't go to produce blue light. It goes to activate GFP that then produces green light. And GFP on its own is a wonderful protein because it's a fluorescent protein. All you have to do is shine light on it and you get a different color out. And when I heard that in the seminar, I said, that's for me. I have a transparent animal. I want to know where genes are expressed. This is going to be great. So the next day, I spent a lot of time, these are my notes from that day, I actually kept them for some reason, I guess because I was excited about it, and I found out about this guy, Doug Prasher. Doug had already at the time, and now the work that Shimamura did was 1962 it was published. This, the time I heard the seminar was 1989. Doug Prasher at that time had already cloned the gene for a quarin and was now starting to clone the gene for green fluorescent protein. So we had this wonderful conversation. When he got it, we were going to test it in worms and other things, and it was going to be a great time. And then the problem started. So the first problem was I got married. Now, let me explain why that was a problem. In most cases, in most instances, it was not a problem at all. It was very nice. but. My wife at the time was at the University of Utah, not at Columbia. That's 2,000 miles away, and I decided I would just as soon be near her than not. I had a sabbatical coming. I went to work in her lab. It turned out that while I was in her lab was when Doug Prasher cloned the gene. He tried to get in touch with me. He couldn't get in touch with me. He decided I had dropped out of science, and that was it. So I thought he was too embarrassed to call me. And he thought I had dropped out of science, so we never talked to each other. Three years later, I had a student come into my lab to start doing a beginning project, and I told her about it, and uh, she got excited about the idea. And we, I said, well, you know, the university has just put this wonderful database on our computers with all the published papers. Let's look up and see if there's any paper about another fluorescent protein because this guy's never going to call me. And what we find is that the beginning of the list is his paper. He actually had already published it. And I said, why didn't he call me? And I ran downstairs to the library. I got the journal out, and the journal article was really fantastic because it had something that hardly any other journal article has. It had his phone number. So I called him up. I get the clone, I, we, we talk about it, we figure out that we both were mistaken about what the other person was doing, and he sends us the clone, 
and we start to do the work. Now, there was a problem here. Everybody at the time that knew about green fluorescent protein, maybe all 10 people in the world, knew that it was a very interesting protein because this protein didn't need anything else added to it to be fluorescent. But it did have one special attribute. You know that proteins are made up of a string of amino acids, one connected to the other in a line. Well, GFP is slightly different from that in the sense that this is what it starts off as. So this is called the peptide backbone, and the amino acids come off at various positions here. But something happens to it to mature the protein. And what is made is this extra five-membered ring. And that extra five-membered ring is what allows it to be fluorescent. And no one at the time knew if it was going to take one enzyme, two enzymes, five more enzymes to mature this protein. And so if it did require other things, this was going to be a horrible tool because you wanted it to work just on its own. And most of the people sort of gave up. Uh, thinking, and everyone thought, oh, it's going to require other things, so it's not so interesting. We decided to take a chance, and this student tried it, and one month after she started graduate school, she came to me and she said, I've got fluorescent bacteria, here's the picture. So this is the page from her lab notebook, and shows a picture of Gia Skirka there, the, the student who did the work. And she had strongly fluorescing bacteria, and uh, one other interesting thing about this lab page is it says that she used the microscope from Engineering Terrace. She had already gotten a degree, a, a master's degree in chemical engineering at Columbia. And she had worked on fluorescence, which is one way, reason I tried to get her excited about this project. And she took one look at the microscope we had in the lab and said, this is a piece of junk. I won't be able to see the fluorescence with this microscope. So she went back to her old lab and was able to see it which was very good for me because if she had looked with ours, she would have said, oh, maybe something else is needed. But within one month, she had green fluorescent protein. We did other work on showing that it could work not only in bacteria but in worms and started giving it out to people so they could work on it. And eventually we had this paper that we submitted to science. So now comes the part where I tell you a little bit about the problems of scientific publishing. So the first thing was we sent the paper in to be reviewed. Now in science, science is such a prestigious journal that they have an editorial board that first has to look at the paper and decide whether it's worthy enough to send out to the reviewers who can then reject it. But the edit editors have to first look at the thing. And they took one look at the title and they said, no, you can't submit this. The title was Green Fluorescent Protein, A New Marker for Gene Expression. I thought it was a good title. But they said, no, everything that's published in science is new or novel. You cannot use those words. So I said, OK, I'll, I'll make up another title. I don't like being told what to do. It just somehow makes me angry. So the title is a little long. It was, the Aquaria Victoria green fluorescent protein needs no exogenously added component to produce a fluorescent product in prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. <laughs> this is basically the entire paper. I could have just submitted the title and asked them to review that. And then it got accepted. That was very nice. And it got accepted and they said, and then I got the copy editor calling me up and said, you know that title? It's a little long. Can you change it? And I said, sure. And I changed it to green fluorescent protein as a marker for gene expression. And they said that was fine. The other problem with publishing this paper is the picture that we, put, that we submitted to be put on the cover. We were, I was extremely excited about this because this is actually a picture of a living animal. And this is a growing nerve cell with its growth cone right there. And I was very happy that we had actually caught it just at the right time. So it was a, like, I thought it was one in a million picture. And I sent it in, and they decided to use it on the cover, and then the art editor for the cover called me up and said, you know, it's a nice picture, but there's one color that we can't really reproduce well on the cover, and that's green. Can we change the color? 
I said, no, I'm sorry, that's the, you can't, so they didn't. The third problem, and this is what Leon almost told you about, was that I said we had given away clones to people to try on their own experiment, and they were already getting successful results. And we wanted to say, other people are finding this true. This isn't something that's just in bacteria or in worms. And most of these people, we asked them permission to use their unpublished data, and they all said yes. One person was problematic. And I have her letter here, uh, and I'll read it to you. It may be a little faint here. It is perfectly fine with me to cite our work, provided you do the following conditions. You make coffee every Saturday morning for the next two months, ready by 8.30. You prepare a special French dinner at the time of your choosing, and you empty the garbage nightly for the next month. This is my wife. <laughs> so uh, she says I've never paid up. Uh, we debate about this to this day. But what she did actually was the next really important experiment. And that experiment was what we had shown is if you take the controlling elements for a gene, it'll turn on GFP. But what she asked was a very different and very important question. What if you made a fusion protein? a protein that you're interested in, and label it with GFP. Basically, hand the protein a flashlight and ask the question, where is it? And that's what she did. She made the first protein fusion. And this hybrid is shown here. This is actually the developing uh, egg chamber of Drosophila, fruit fly. This is the oocyte that's being made, and these are called the nurse cells. And the nurse cells are making lots and lots of protein, and funneling that protein into the egg. And you can actually see it actually going through this pore right here as it's being funneled through. It comes to lie along this edge and back here and nowhere else in the cell. And she could watch this in living cells. So I actually did want to be able to say that we could use this, and I, I still think I'm paying up, but uh, be that as it may. Uh, the things that make GFP a very useful marker is that it's heritable. We put the DNA that encodes for GNP into the animal and all of its subsequent progeny make the GFP because they have the DNA. And so we don't have to do the prep every time. We just start with an animal and all of its subsequent or plant or bacterium and all of the subsequent progeny have GFP in it. The molecule itself is small, and what this means, that beta-galactosidase I showed is enormous. It's 16 times the molecular weight of GFP. It never gets out of the cell body. But GFP is small enough to diffuse all the way through cells, so you actually get a chance to see their entire shape. Third, the molecule is small and monomeric. Uh, and uh, this also helps with this. I'm sorry, that, that's the diffusion. I, I skipped the second one. It's a non-invasive technique. We're not killing the animals. We're not poking holes in them. We're not fixing their, their cells. What we're simply doing is shining virtually innocuous blue light on the animals and getting green light telling us where these things are. So it's, it's non-invasive, so we can start to look at biological processes, and especially because of the last part. We can do this in living tissue. So we can see cells in tissue culture, we can see cells within living animals, and actually watch what happens as time goes on. So it gives us, really for the first time, a dynamic view of biological processes, not a static view. So people have used this quite a lot. Here's a gallery of uh, examples. Uh, we have the worms. This is with its entire nervous system uh, stained with GFP. This is a canola plant. This is fruit fly, mice, zebrafish. And this is Alba, the GFP bunny. The, uh, the artist Eduardo Koch, he's from Brazil originally, but I think he actually lives in Chicago somewhere, uh, commissioned a French com company to make him a transgenic bunny. And he, uses, he used Alba, Alba is no longer with us. Uh, he used Alba, he used to display Alba at art installations that he would do to get people to talk about the interaction between arts and technology and arts and science. On the right hand side are some pictures of cells, uh, some mouse cells in culture. This is Drosophila. Uh, this is uh, Rabidopsis, uh, mustard plant. Uh, 
cells. And this is, I think, a, a mouse Purkinje cell in the brain, in the cerebellum. And you can see the GFP is going through all of the arborization. So you see the entire cell uh, expressing things here. Um, I want to give you some examples of, uh, of why GFP can be seen in living animals and what you can learn. So this is a picture. I, I actually haven't said too much about the color scheme of the names. The color scheme of the names are anybody whose name is in red worked in my lab or works in my lab. Anyone whose name is in blue is a collaborator. And anyone, as in this case, whose name is in black did something I wish I had done. Okay. So uh, what Rosalind Silverman Gavrilla did was take the early Drosophila embryo, fruit fly embryo, and use GFP, in this case, attached to one of the major microtubule proteins, such that the spindle, you know, where the cell chromosomes divide during cell division, you have this array of microtubules that take the chromosomes apart. Well, she could then see these. So she could follow cell division. Now in Drosophila, when in the early embryo, there is no, there are no cell boundaries separating the nuclei. All the nuclei are together in the embryo, and they all divide at the same time. And so what this picture shows is that synchronous division of, of the cells. So let me just run the movie, hopefully. Oh, please go. Oh, no. Well, that's disappointing. Let's try that again. The other movie worked. Oh, it's such a beautiful movie. Hmm. I don't understand why that didn't work. Then you're not going to be able to see probably the other movies here either. But uh, you know this picture by Van Gogh, Starry Night. This is her version of Starry Night. Now, unfortunately, you didn't see the spindles moving. But she also made GFP onto a protein that is uh, localized into the inside of nuclei. So whenever there's a nucleus, the protein goes in the nucleus. And she color-coded this such that if there's a little GFP, it's blue, a little bit more, it's yellow, a little bit more, it's eventually up to red. And let's hope that this movie works. And if this doesn't work, then I'm going to give up. Sorry, it's not working. Maybe, maybe afterwards I'll be able to figure out the movies and people can stay with that. Um, but the idea of being able to get different colors is something that's attractive. And the third person that was part of our triumvirate in uh, Stockholm, uh, Roger Chen, uh, did a lot to improve GFP. He actually changed the colors of GFP. Um, and now, uh, using a variety of different techniques, has a whole series of colors that uh, range all the way from blue to red, actually he now has a new one that actually gives off light in the infrared. Um, these are now uh, all called uh, by different uh, fruits names. So I think this is, at, at the right I think is tomato, uh, and then there's orange and lemon. Uh, it's not lemon, I think that's banana. And then there's melon and blueberry and things like that. So all of these different fluorescent proteins mean that you can label different cells with different colors. And the most ex expansive use of this has been done by two guys at Harvard, Jeff Lickman and Josh Sains, who have uh, figured out a way of having nerve cells express different amounts of only four proteins. But because they're all in different amounts and they're different colors, every nerve cell gets labeled a different color. They call this brain bow, and these are, whoops. Let me go back, pass it. And these are the pictures that they, they have of this, of being able to have all these different cells expressed. This is not the only thing that you can do with GFP. There's a wonderful property of fluorescent molecules. If you have two fluorescent molecules, and they are close enough together, you get what's called Forster resonance energy transfer. And what this is, is that the energy that would go into producing light from one molecule doesn't produce that light, but instead gets transferred to the other molecule, 
and so light is produced from it instead. So let me go back here and show this picture of Roger's stuff. Here is an example of one of the tools that he developed. It has two fluorescent proteins. This one is excited by UV and gives off blue light. This is excited by blue light and gives off a yellow green. But in its normal state in the molecule, these two are far apart. So far, it actually, they have to be so close together, they have to be touching for this transfer to take place. So normally they're not touching. And so when you shine ultraviolet light on here, you get blue light out. However, if calcium is around, then these two parts come together. And when they come together, now the two fluorescent proteins are close enough so that when UV light is shine, shown here, you get yellow light. <coughs> me. So by looking at how much blue light comes out and how much yellow light comes out, you get a way of measuring the amount of calcium in a cell. This technique of being able to use two molecules to read out a, an activity in the cell mean we can put the DNA for this in and have this made in whatever cell we want. We can watch nerve cells as they get excited and calcium runs into the cells, then they become bright, more yellow than blue, and then it goes down. So people have been able to actually watch nerve cells working in intact animals. There's other uses of this as well. Uh, here's an example here where the two parts are close together, but they have a small bit of protein here that is a site that could be cut. Well, of course, every time it's cut, then these things are no longer close to each other. So you can tell how much has been cut and how much has not been cut. You can also look to say, I wonder if these two proteins come close to each other. If they do normally, if they bind to each other, then these two can come close enough together, so now again, more yellow than blue. So all of these are ways of being able to monitor what's happening in living cells based on these changes of fluorescence. There's a very nice series of things, again, started by Roger Chen. Um, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to show this movie either, which is actually what I think the very first, I'm going to try it. How did the first movie work and then nothing else afterwards? That's too bad. Well, this was a movie that was going to purport to show the first human transgenic with GFP. Now, as you can imagine, there haven't been transgenic humans with GFP, although this movie claimed that it was and is actually the basis of a particular color abnormality of this individual, which is this person. <laughs> Ang Lee's movie of Hulk, um, when it came out, I had everybody in my lab said, oh, you got to see this movie. This is fantastic. And if you saw the thing, there's, there's actually a little bit at the very beginning where there's a jellyfish coming, and then this hypodermic comes in and somehow miraculously takes all the GFP out of it. Yeah. If Shimamura had known that, it would have been terrific. But in any case, uh, the claim is that it's the injection of the DNA from the jellyfish that then turns the Hulk green. It, it, the gene gets turned on when he's angry. So, and I was very excited about this, and it turns out that Ang Lee's um, script writer is a guy named James Shamas, and James Shamas and uh, his daughter and my daughter went to elementary school together, and he's on the Columbia faculty, so I went up to him one day and I said, James, I, I just saw the, the Hulk, and, 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 I, and I'm, how did you know about my work? And he said, what work do you do? It turned out it was an MIT graduate student or student that was working on the set of the movie that suggested, oh, you know, you could make GFP as the basis of doing this. And they changed the script to be able to do that. So this is the only case I know of where it's in, actually, it's, it, it, it made the movies, at least so far. In any case, um, let me tell you quickly, in the little bit of time I have left, uh, uh, 10 minutes or so, uh, some of the things we've done in my lab for this. Because remember, we're really interested in this problem of touch and finding out about genes. So uh, we've used this to look at gene expression. We've looked at it to, again, to look where proteins go. And actually, our touch channel proteins, the ones that we think are important for touch, actually are not found uniform, but if you see in that middle section, right here, 
they're in this very nice dotted arrangement. So we actually see where all the transduction points are on the cell. We can label the cells in the animals and then mutate the animals and ask, do they have more branches, which this actually shows? Do they have less branches? Do they branch abnormally? Do, are there more cells or less cells? Are the cells in the wrong place? Once you're able to label something, you can ask a whole series of new questions simply because now you can see these things. More than that, we can label the cells, break open the embryo, culture all the cells, and only see the ones that are our cells because they're the ones that are GFP positive. There's a wonderful machine called a fluorescence activated cell sorter. This is a machine that basically works on the basis of the famous Millikan experiment, where you take droplets of water and each droplet has a cell in it. You have a laser that detects, that, that shines blue light onto the, the droplet. If it's fluorescent, you can detect that it's that. A charge is put on the droplet, and just like in the Millikan experiment, it goes off at an angle and goes into the test tube. You can collect all this to the cells you want. So we can isolate just the cells we're interested in because they're labeled fluorescently. And we've used that to identify the RNAs that are in these cells. So a lot of different things to do. One final example. People, when Sidney Brenner started working on C. elegans in the early 1960s, People basically, he said, I'm going to use this to study the genetics of the nervous system. And everyone said, you know, you can't actually record electrically from the cells. It's impossible. You can't do it. And he sort of said, yes, but we can do a lot of other things. And the problem is that the cells are incredibly small and that it's very hard to stick a microelectrode in those cells. There's another problem with sticking a microelectrode into the animal. The animal is under such an, a very high internal pressure that when you stick the microelectrode in the animal, it explodes. It doesn't make the prep easy under those circumstances. So it was very nice that a GFP-based method was uh, developed uh, by a, a, a student and uh, or a postdoc named Miriam Goodman. Miriam came to me to work in the lab and said that this is what she wanted to figure out, a way to measure the electrical properties of the cells. And I had the good sense to say, don't work with me. I'm not going to be that helpful. But there's this guy in Oregon, Sean Lockery, go work with him. And in one year, they figured out how to do this. Then she came back to my lab, worked on it, and then has her own lab at Stanford, where she's now uh, where we've collaborated. So we've been trying to figure out all of these proteins and whether these proteins are important for touch. And so this is a picture of Miriam. You see she has two colors, one because she was a postdoc and another because she's a collaborator. Um, and Bob O'Hagan was a graduate student who did this. And they wanted to know, were these proteins that we found, were they the touch sensors? That's the question we're trying to ask. And so she did that by, you take the animals, you glue the animal down, you poke an electrode over here where it makes no difference to get rid of most of that internal pressure. And then you make a little cut near where the cell is here. And because the cell has GFP in it, you can always see where the cell is, even if it's not exactly in the right place. You can stick an electrode on it and record from the cell at the same time as you're tapping the animal with the stimulus probe. And what Bob and Miriam found was that in the wild type animals, this is the touch, that's about a half a second. This is the trace of the current. And to just briefly explain what this is, if the current goes down, which you see here, that means sodium is rushing into the cells. It's a sodium current into the cells. And so you see that just as the touch starts, there's a massive inrush of sodium, and then it goes back to the previous level, the normal level. And then when you take the stimulus away, the same thing happens again. So that was the start. We could actually record a mechanical, a, a, an electrical response in these cells when the animals were touched. And it happens very quickly, less than a half a millisecond. And that's too quick for any chemicals to be involved, chemical signaling to be involved. It has to be a direct opening of electrical channels. And we had a, a candidate for this channel 
made up of these proteins, MEK4 and MEK10. And so they ask the question, well, what happens if we use a mutant that's defective in MEK4? No activity. How about these other proteins that are part of this? No activity, no activity. So this is a pretty good experiment. It says when you get rid of this gene, can't make the protein, then it doesn't work. But unfortunately, it doesn't tell you a lot. It says that's something that's necessary, but it doesn't say that it's actually the sensor. The way I like to think about it is, imagine you're trying to figure out what makes a car move forward. Right? If you're thinking about a car, what makes a car move forward, a critical component is the door key. Right? Can't get in the car, nothing's going to happen. It won't move forward. Now, it won't also move backwards, too. I mean, I can even give you a developmental example. If you don't pay the guy that built the car, it's not going to be built, and so it won't move forward either. So having something not work doesn't actually tell you much. It says it's, something, it's important somewhere, but it could be very indirect. But on the other hand, if you were studying that car, and you had a defect where you said, you know, I have this piece, and normally, it, it's in, in the normal car, the, animal, the, the car moves forward. But when I change this piece, every time I do all the same things to make it go forward, it goes backwards. <coughs> then you have to say that piece must be important for that decision to go forward and backwards. And we had the genetic equivalent of that. So what we have here is the same experiment again. We give the touch, we get the current, both when we start the touch and when it ends, and here we have our mutants that don't work. But now what we do is we go to a different voltage, a voltage that's not as powerful for this experiment. And what that does is we expect the wild type to just have a little blip here and a little blip here, but because these are dead, we don't expect any change. But that's not what happens. What happened for these particular, these are particular mutants with particular changes in these proteins, we got this. So the wild type did have smaller blips, but the mutants were working, except they went in the wrong direction. So this isn't sodium coming into the cell, it's potassium going out of the cell. So we've done the equivalent of changing that gear. So now they go backwards rather than forwards. So instead of having sodium come in, <coughs> excuse me, potassium is going out. So this says to us that this, because this is very fast and because we've changed the resulting activity by changing this protein, that this protein has to be involved in that sensing. This turns out to be the best evidence anyone has in any system for it. In fact, it's the only animal sensor in any nerve cell. So I'm quite proud of these experiments. Let me take, um, a couple of minutes, I'm going to skip some things, so let me sort of go to the, I had a lot of things to talk about, but I won't talk about them. Let me just end by sort of talking about what I think the implications are of the research that I've been talking about here. One thing I didn't mention, I will, I will mention, uh, when we started looking more at that, ch that group of proteins that make the channel in the touch cell, we had one that was worked on by, uh, or it wasn't worked on, it was a, a, a person called me up from Germany, uh, Thomas Benzing, and he said, you know, this protein you have is very interesting to us. And I said, oh, why? He says, because we have a very similar protein that we're studying, except we're studying it in the kidney. And people that are defective in this protein, and there are some people that have this as an inherited disorder, these people come into the clinic, there's many reasons people come into the clinic with this, but they come into the clinic because their kidneys are not filtering the blood appropriately and they get protein in the urine. Now there's many reasons that guy could come about, but this was one of them. <coughs> now I sort of vowed at the end of graduate school that I would never work on the kidney, but I did. And then the next thing I vowed was that I wasn't going to work on any lipids or fats. And it turns out that his protein and our protein actually are cholesterol binding proteins. And the binding of cholesterol actually makes the channels work, both in the kidney and in our cells. So suddenly we're 
studying kidney, and a human inherited disease. More than that, and I want to give this as an example because I'm finding it fascinating, even though we have no evidence for this, very little evidence, but we have the idea. You know, cholesterol is the building block that makes steroids. And so Thomas and I were sort of talking about this, and we said, you know, could this be, these proteins actually bind steroids? Would that be a way that they might be affecting what's going on in the human cells. And we knew that that was not how steroids were supposed to work. Steroids are supposed to work by going right through the plasma membrane of the cell, binding to a protein in the cytoplasm, and going into the nucleus and turning on gene expression. And that takes a day or so, sometimes more. But we were saying, maybe it's working on something in the membrane, and it's very fast. So we looked in the literature, and we found to our great glee that there was, in fact, a number of papers, in the hundreds actually, where people had said, you know, there's some things that affect, that, that steroids have effects on that are not in transcription. You can stop transcription, you still get the effects. And they usually occur within one hour in an entire animal, like a mouse. <coughs> so I call up Thomas to tell him about this, and he starts getting very excited. And I ask him why, and he says, the reason is when people come into our clinic at the hospital with protein in their urine, we give them a shot of glucocorticoids, of steroids. And within one hour, they usually get relief. I said, oh, that's terrific. And they said, and I can't believe it, but I, I oh, this is horrible. He said, I should have realized this before. There's a protein that when it's defective, when people come in, they are not helped by the steroids. It's, and the disease is steroid-resistant kidney disease. And I said, Thomas, we should start studying that protein. He says, we are. That's our protein. That's the one we've been studying that looks like your protein. So we don't know yet. We're still doing the experiments. But it may be that we have discovered a new type of steroid binding protein that may have a lot of implications to how cells function and the control that these steroids have on some cells. It's very early and it's more guesswork than anything else, but it's an exciting new area. So that, I needed to tell you that because now I'm going to tell you what the, I think the researchers taught me. The first thing is that science is progressive. It progresses in a cumulative way. Shimamura made this fabulous discovery and it sat there for about 30 years. I was fortunate enough with Doug Prasher to be able to show that this could be a useful tool in cell biology. Roger Chen improved it, and in fact, thousands of people have improved it, making all these various tools. And what makes it important is all of the input from all of these people, not the individual contributions of, of the people. And it's still changing and evolving, and more and more ideas are coming up. And it's also stimulated people to go out and find other interesting biological molecules, and, and there have been a number which I'd be glad to talk to people about. The other thing is that I found that the people that were the innovators that started new things in the lab were the students and the postdocs. When we started I started telling people about green fluorescent protein, we gave it away to people, and we said, you know, we just, you know, anybody that wanted it, we gave it to them. I would get calls from people, the heads of lab, and the, the, they almost invariably started their sentences by saying, I have a graduate student in my lab who told me about this green fluorescent protein, what is this? Or I have a postdoc that is doing this. They were the ones that were pushing the heads of the lab to actually get off their behinds and do some work and get something that they thought would be useful for the research. So it's really the students at, that are the driving force in labs. Third thing, and this gets back to my non-translational research, is that I think that basic research is really essential for all of these discoveries. And I think it is the, the engine that drives innovation, whether we're talking about insights into human disease or advances in agriculture or industry, that you need to have the basic research. This work on jellyfish, on worms, 
was not started to try to understand anything about human disease, but to try to answer some very fundamental biological problems. And there's lots more of these fundamental biological problems. I don't have a problem with translational research. I'll give you two anecdotes which tell you where I have a problem with it. And that one is, and this occurred I think about five years ago, at the National Cancer Institute, that the then head of the National Cancer Institute had a meeting that I was told about in which he had invited a number of very prominent scientists and said to them, don't you think that we have learned enough biology now and we can simply apply what we know to cancer and we can put all our money into just directly uh, uh, things that apply to cancer, that we already know enough biology. But you know, if you go and you look at any of the genome sequencing projects, the human genome project, the worm genome project, fly genome, any of these genomes. Yes, the DNA is sequenced, but when you look and see where the predicted genes are, the 20 or 30,000 genes that are in these genomes, more than half of them have the following tag, that they make a protein of unknown function. We have no idea what they do. So we don't even know what the parts list is for us or how they work together. So we have a, a profound thing. The other thing is, with because I'm an equal opportunity complainer, um, so that was during the Bush years. During the Obama years, we had this wonderful stimulus package, and it was wonderful, and it really helped. And the first thing that National Institutes of Health did was to set up what they called, they asked for proposals for what they called the challenge grants. They had a hundred different topics for the challenge grants, and you could apply to whichever one. They only wound up giving four grants in each one of the topics, so 400 grants. They had over 20,000 applications for this money. But of the 100 topics, 98 of them were translational research topics. Two of them were basic research topics. To me, I don't, it's not that I don't like translational research. I think it's very important. I just want this, things to be evened out a little bit. And that's, that's what I think is very important. And finally, the last thing I want to say is we have learned, when people started, when Sidney Brittner started working on nematodes, and when I went as a postdoc in his lab, people would say to me, why do you want to waste your time studying this organism? What are you going to learn in this organism? We have other things to study already. And I'm sure that people sort of discounted all of Shimamura's work with je uh, the jellyfish and looking at those proteins. And to me at least, I think there's been quite a number of really wonderful discoveries that have come out of all of this. And GFP has been the foundation of a vast amount of more research. So I think we should not be so narrow in how we approach biology. We shouldn't only be thinking about what happens in the so-called model organisms, the ones that everybody has been studying, because there's an enormous amount of life out there and we know almost nothing about it, and we should be studying that. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I think there's quite a number of people that I can't cite you a particular experiment, uh, but yes, people are, are doing this to look at whether genes are being expressed or not, because it's a nice marker for that. It's also been used to mark histones, which are often modified and and. To, to ask where they're going and, and so on. So people have done this, I think, quite a lot. It's been used in a lot of ways. I, let, let me tell you my favorite way that GFP, I mean, there's lots of favorite ways that GFP has been used. Uh, there are uh, researchers at, at Mount Sinai Hospital in, in, uh, in, in, in New York who have been studying HIV. And, uh, you know, if you're studying HIV, one of the questions is, well, why doesn't a vaccine work? or how can, what can we design for a vaccine? And so you really want to ask the question, where does this, how does this 
virus get from one cell to another? Now, the usual way people think about viruses is that it infects a cell, and then that cell explodes and gives out its virus that then goes on to affect another cell. Well, if you had an antibody, maybe it could glom onto that virus and protect people or get rid of it, filter it away, if that's what happened, if it explodes and gets just spewed out everywhere. Unfortunately, what these guys have shown, because they've made GFP, uh, HIV with GFP, so wherever the virus is, you're going to get a green cell, is that what happens is you get an infected cell, and it goes to another cell, basically kissing it, and basically injects the virus from one cell to the other. It never goes outside. So if that's the case, you're going to have to come up with a different scheme of how to control that. I think that's very important. And let me give another example that actually may not work, but I like the idea behind it. It was tried by a guy named Bob Berlin at, uh, uh, he was at Oak Ridge National Labs, and now he's at uh, University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. Um, he did a very interesting experiment. Unfortunately, it didn't repeat, but the idea behind it, I think, was wonderful. I talked before about these controlling elements that can turn things on in particular times, turn genes on in, in different times. Well, it turns out that in some bacteria, one of these control elements gets turned on, will turn on a gene, if it's in the presence of TNT, the explosive. <laughs> Who would have guessed? But that's a very interesting thing. And so what he did is he made bacteria in which that controlling component turned on GFP. So whenever TNT was around, the bacteria would glow, would make GFP, and you could see them. And then he was reported to have gone into a field. I think it was like 300 feet by 300 feet, or maybe it's 300 yards by 300 yards, in which some, somebody else had buried five landmines. Now, the landmines were disconnected, so they weren't going to explode, but they still had the TNT in them that landmines have. And supposedly, he sprayed the field with his GFP bacteria and was able to come back after a couple of weeks with a UV lamp at night and find the location of all five of the landmines. And he then couldn't reproduce it. So it's maybe not the best, although I do know there was a company that was also trying to do this with plants. So you sowed see the seeds for the plant, the plants would come up and have green fluorescent protein if they were near things. And there have been other companies that have tried a similar idea. I think the idea is the right thing here. It's not whether it worked or not. It's the way of using science to do good. Landmines are perhaps the world's worst thing that have been invented. If this would be a way of being able to detect it so kids were not maimed and innocent people in general were not maimed by this, that would be wonderful. And it's a, a use that just needs a creative mind to get it to go. So that, those are among my favorite things of, of, of how people are doing this. Yes. So the question is, what turns ordinary people into scientists? And I would say, well, we are ordinary people. Uh, <laughs> I think that's that's the first part. Um, I, you know, I'm not very good at giving advice. I'm, I'm because I'm I'm sort of not sure what what to say because. My own journey through life has now been, I always think everyone is an N of one, right? Everybody is different. Um, for myself, I have always been interested in puzzles. I've always been interested in nature. I, you know, I, I find, you know, when somebody describes an interesting experiment, to me that's really beautiful. Um, I don't know how to make someone like that. I think it sounds to me from the day I've spent here that people here are doing a very good job of doing that, of taking people that are interested and showing them that it's a worthwhile enterprise to be part of. I think we could do more as parents and teachers of making people say, make people realize that this is an important activity for people to be involved in and try to get more people involved in it. Uh, I think mainly by example and by 
uh, maybe telling people about really the wonderful things that have happened. I'll, I'll give you a, when, when I was in, inducted into the National Academy, uh, they, it, it's a funny induction, right? You got 70 people and they all walk across the stage about one a minute. And they, they shake the hand of the president of the society, of, of the academy. And there's somebody in the back that says a two sentence sentence, a, a, a two sentence blurb about what their work was. And at the time, my daughter was about 11 years old and didn't have a great deal of patience. And she, and at the end of it, I went up to her thinking that she was probably bored out of her mind listening to all these things. And I said, sweetie, you know, how are you doing? Is this okay for you? I'm sorry it's been so long. She said, are you kidding, Dad? Every single person that walked across that stage did something that no one else in the world had done before them. And she, she was absolutely right. And so the thing is, if we can convince other people that that's the thing, that there's, there's these many, many things that we all can do that are going to be the first of everything, that to me excites me. Hope that answers it. Yes. Well, uh, in part, I was just sort of aimlessly trying to figure out what I was going to do. And then I had this absolute, it turned out I had an absolutely wonderful experience working in a lab where an idea I had actually worked. And that was really quite stimulating to think that maybe I could come up with ideas and they would be sort of worthwhile. I, when I went to, first went to graduate school, I, I, I would go into my advisor and I would say, uh, I just read this paper. Now, you know, this is this, this, is, this could happen like this. This would be a nice experiment, right? And he said, oh yeah, I read a paper about that a week ago. That's fine. And this happened for a long time. And I finally said, you know, this is the most depressing enterprise I've ever been on. And he said, no, 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 you're completely wrong. You're coming up with the good ideas. It's not that you're not thinking of the good ideas, it's just you know, you're not working in the lab yet. So I, I think you know, being able to come up with ideas, being able to get some results, even though they don't come every day, um, is, is really stimulating and exciting. I think that's why most people like it. It's, you know, that's that one, you know, when we saw the green fluorescent bacteria there was a lot of jumping around and shouting in the lab. I mean, that we were very excited about that. That was lots of fun to see. So I think that's, that's what got me back in. You know, if, if you keep failing, you sort of eventually say, I'm gonna stop hitting my head against the wall. But uh, fortunately, uh, I was able to go back and try it a second time. 